Alright, so I hope everyone is enjoying their lunch. Um, please feel free to continue to eat. Um, we are going to start just in a sense of time. Um, so my name is Michelle Guido. Um, I work here at RSM. Um, as Dan mentioned, I, I lead the education practice here in Boston alongside with them. Um, this afternoon we're going to be talking about data privacy and security, um, best practices, experiences, etc. So today we have with us Elaine Marcuse, um, who's a Director of Privacy and Security here at RSM. We have Lisa Larson, who is the President of Eastern Navy Community College. And we have Peter Stone, who is a Sales Engineer at Mindcast. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Elaine to kick off. <coughs> Well, uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. We, we figured we'd, uh, can everybody hear me again? We, we figured we'd put the security, cyber security right after lunch because it tends to counteract the effects of lunch. I, I think I have met uh, many of you, for, for those I, I haven't, uh, my name is uh, Idala Marcus, there would be a quiz uh, on pronunciation at the end. I have uh, about 30 years of experience in the field and I started with 24-7 global IT production operations, so little company like Swift, which you may have heard of. If you're transferring money from country A to country B, it goes through the Swift network. So that taught me a little, a little thing or two about how to keep computer systems networks up and running 24 hours a day. My wife used to joke it was great training for having a baby. <laughs> we never knew what was going to happen when. Uh, but also started to uh, learn about security because of course everybody was at the network. network. Uh, so I moved from global infrastructure to cybersecurity and then more recently to data privacy. So my role here at RSM is I lead our cybersecurity consulting team uh, here uh, in Boston for the New England market. And I also lead our data privacy consulting team nationally for RSM US. And in that context, I work very closely with our European member firm because, of course, we can combine with things like the, the GDPR, the European General Data Protection Regulation, <coughs> without involving our European firm as well. So that's. that's uh, quick background, and we used to refer to ourselves as the security and privacy team, as Michelle referenced it earlier, it's now the privacy and security team, which, just to put a little bit of context ahead of, of the discussion that we're going into, I, I put it in the perspective of what's changed in the last 30 years in the security and privacy field. So if I can take you back to the time when I had hair, um, we, it used to be simple, right? The security and privacy used to be what we didn't think at the time, but in retrospect, relatively simple. This, you know, the first wave of what we had to worry about was how do we defend our, our organization's crown jewels, our data, you know, what we need to worry about, um, our secrets. Uh, we were dealing with maybe hundreds of devices, um, all comfortably behind a firewall. Uh, you know, penalties didn't really add up to much of the, if we were hit for penalties for breaches of security or non-compliance with security obligations. It was maybe in the middle of all, but that's about it. So what we had to worry about in those days were simple things. Uh, firewalls, antivirus, patching, uh, access controls, and the like. Fortunately, those are all things we all have absolutely completely nailed and we're totally on top of this, right? Uh, I put patching in, in red there because that's of course what got Equifax among others. Uh, so just because this has been, this particular wave of security concerns has been around us for decades, it doesn't mean it's easy and it doesn't mean we don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, but because we can't rest in that world, along came wave two, which is, we're still worrying about the same thing, right? Uh, defending our organization's secrets, crown jewels, and so on. 
But now, what we have to defend is much, much bigger. The attack surface has exploded because the perimeter went away. The perimeter walks in and out of the door every day uh, on mobile devices, on smartphones, and the like. And beyond that, we as organizations are moving away from the perimeter anyway because we're moving everything to the cloud because the cloud will keep us safe, right? So on top of that, more recently, we have the Internet of Things. Think about nuclear power plants controlled via network devices. Um, you get some idea of what, what fun we can have there. Um, I play both roles of this. I, I play the defense side and the, and the offense side. So we do penetration testing. As well, one, one year I was trying to see what it would take to get into a chemical manufacturing plant, and it took us all of eight hours to get to their industrial control systems, uh, at which point it became very bad news. So we'll go to bad news <coughs> later in the panel. But now we're talking about thousands of devices and penalties in the tens of millions. If you look at reaches like Target, Home Depot, and the like, what the total cost to those organizations was, it was an in the tens of millions of dollars. So that, those were waves one or two that are still around with us. What we're adding on top of that now is the third wave, which is privacy considerations. So now, on top of defending what we have been defending for the last few decades, which is our organization's data, now we're being held accountable to defend the data that's entrusted to us by individuals of all kinds. Students, professors, visitors, um, parents, you name it, uh, if they have given us their name, email address, uh, in any way, shape, or form, uh, we have obligations to protect that. And we have obligations to protect that uh, even if you don't have a breach. So you have a responsibility to make sure that they have the right access. If someone comes and asks you, tell me what data you have about me, how you collected it, where you collected it, what you're doing with it, how you're securing it, when was the last time you had a breach, and what you did about that, you are required to respond, even if nothing happened. Um, so the policy chart, of course, for this kind of regulation is a general data protection regulation. And if you look at what's happening there in the privacy world, uh, the European Commission published a report in, uh, in January of the first eight months. In the first eight months of the regulation, complaints from individuals about their subject, their rights were not being handled appropriately, their requests were not handled appropriately, were coming in at the pace of about 400 per day. Those are the kind of complaints that led to Google being fined $57 million. Uh, so Google didn't have a breach, they were fined because they were not handling consumer information to the satisfaction of those consumers. That's a new world we happen to be in. So if you look at the, the latest headlines, to just two of them, to characterize what we're facing, one is a Google one, uh, which was in January. The other one is, is in the news this week, uh, which is Facebook uh, just made a provision for $3 billion uh, in their latest earnings report because they expect to be fined $5 billion by the Federal Trade Commission for privacy violations. So again, there was no breach. It was just privacy violations. So that's that's a brave new world. That's, that's just context uh, on how security and privacy have been evolving and how privacy is becoming yes. a way top of the other two that now we have to give some really serious consideration to. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lisa Larson, and I'm president at Eastern Maine Community College. And um, just to give you a little bit of background about Eastern Maine Community College, we are a member of the Maine Community College system. There are seven colleges within that system. We are the third largest, although I think we're tied for second. That's what I would say. Uh, and he's not here to dispute that today, so we're good. Um, we have more than 30 career and technical programs and a transfer program at the institution. 70% of our students come to us 
because they're interested in career and technical training. 30% come to transfer. We are seeing an increasing number of students who want to um, move into a transfer degree, so that's important to us as well. We do have our main campus in Bangor, Maine, and we have three off-site centers in rural parts of Maine. We serve four counties, um, but we're not, we, we reach just the very top of the northern, northern Maine region, so um, we are considered central Maine, but we're named Eastern Maine Community College. Over 90% of our students um, are from Maine, and 90% stay in Maine. We have a 92% placement rate for those that are going into career and technical programs. 48% are first generation, 75% receive some type of financial aid assistance, and well over half work and support a family to some degree. So um, not unlike many of you in this room, that probably sounds like quite a few of you. I've been there for just um, a few days over three years. And so it's been a great opportunity to learn about the um, state itself and the region and how we're working to help students meet their educational goals, but also how to help our region to continue to thrive and sustain in the changes that we're seeing. So um, being a part of this, this panel today tells you that I'm not here to talk about the great things that we're doing in digital badging or the great things that we're doing in public-private partnerships as relates to healthcare and simulation but instead is to talk about a headline, and a headline that many of you probably uh, would hate to see in your local newspaper, but this was the headline in our local, local newspaper um, almost a year ago, uh, that we reported a possible data breach, and that's where it remains today as a possible data breach, but we had several of our computers uh, that became infected with the malware Emotet. Have you heard of Emotet? Yeah. yeah. How many of you thought that when you got into your careers in higher ed that you would have to spend as much time as you are on this aspect of your work? I don't see any hands going up. <laughs> yeah, I didn't either. And you quickly become a quasi-expert, moving on to expert when these things happen. And um, so what we understood about Emotet is that it uh, infiltrates into your system and it gets into your email system and it starts to act like your users in the email system and it will send other spoofed emails out to people within your college. And um, many of those showed up as an invoice payment that they forgot to pay an invoice payment and we could track it down to a particular person that clicked on that email, on that attachment, because they felt like they needed to make sure that they had paid that invoice. So, and then it just continues to be pervasive and look for other ways to get at um, personal identifiable information, encrypted documents, um, access to financial information about the institution or about your students or stakeholders in your institution. So it took us a few days to figure out that it was the Emotet virus. Once we, did, uh, once we did realize that, we did take immediate steps. We notified local law enforcement and the FBI. And um, we also then implemented practices. If they weren't in place, we were putting them into place. We brought in people from across the system and their IT departments to help us out as local experts. We also called in consultants. We unplugged every computer in the institution. and. Um, it just took us days and days to um, unravel all of this and, um, and understand what the potential was. <clears throat> and the potential was, was that we weren't, we didn't know. The potential was that we had uh, 42,000 former students or employers or current students or employees that may have had their information accessed. And because of that, what we did is then we partnered with um, Experian, and they were they have been a great partner in this. And we created a plan in which we would communicate out the opportunity, the information, and the follow-up steps that we would take as a result of this. Uh, we also then created a communication plan internally to our college staff and our students that was both written and face-to-face. -face. We had a communication plan with the rest of the system colleges and the presidents and those employees, as well as our board of trustees. And then we had a public communication 
um, announcement with the media that we went on with. It was very detailed, uh, it was very um, intentional, very strategic in how we did those things. And <clears throat> the date that it was released, um, we, we probably had all of the local news stations and newspapers come to us, we shared the information, we um, provided additional information of how we were working with Experian. And I would say, not have had, having had this um, extent of an issue, I thought it went all very well. And they were very supportive and in helping us to make sure that as many people as could get this information were going to get this information. Um, to date, we've had about 5% of that population reach out to Experian and take part of the free, the credit monitoring. And to date, we haven't had any identity restoration services needing to be fulfilled. So that is that is good news to date. And since then, we've worked with a security team uh, company out of Portland, Maine. They've come in and done a security audit with us. That left us with 10 recommendations, four of which were high priority, the rest of which were medium priority. Um, as of the end of May, we will have all of those recommendations in place, which has taken a lot of talent from across the system to help us with that, and a lot of resources, both on our college side and then on our the academic side, changing our culture, keeping communication open, as well as the financial side. I think we've, we've, we believe when it's all said and done, by the end of this fiscal year, we'll spend almost $450,000 on all of those things from the Experian contract to an audit to the consultants to uh, fulfilling that framework, the IT framework that needed to be in place. Now, to be truthful, some of that was already planned. Uh, we had just received a bond for $2 million at the institution, and we had highlighted about half of that to go towards IT infrastructure. So that certainly has been helpful, but um, it doesn't come without a cost both the financial cost and the personal cost and how you continue to build relationships once something like this happens. Um, so uh, that's where we're at to date and um, I'll, pre I'll prepare other examples or comments as we go along, but it is something that um, you would never wish on anyone and it is something that you can certainly move through, but it has been a learning experience for the last year for every individual uh, at the institution and all of our stakeholders. Hello, hello. Hi, folks. My name is Peter Stone. I am from Mindcast. We are a cloud based cybersecurity company uh, founded in the UK in 2003, but based here in Lexington, Mass, uh, for the last four years. And we really focus on the number one risk vector for any organization, which is email. Uh, if you think about the digital world, email is your front door, as that is a place that both you rely on for your organization to keep moving internally, but anybody can send you an email at any time. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, their Emotet virus was sent via an invoice document in an email, so obviously there's uh, just one example of that risk. But what we see is that over 90% of all attacks on any organization, not just education, start with an email. So that's where we put a lot of our focus. However, we don't just focus on the security up front or the perimeter as you think of it traditionally. We also think about the risk of privacy. So in addition to security, a security focused platform, we really focus on retention of data, access control of that data, because some of the regulatory requirements aren't just the ability to purge people's data upon request, but also to maintain that, that information if you need to do a forensic analysis, uh, if you ever have to retrieve records, uh, especially if your organization has any type of other regulations around it, like HIPAA, for example, which requires retention of that data. Uh, my practice here at Mindcast is a senior sales engineer, so I work with organizations to understand the risk that you have before implementing a security platform, help educate you on those risks as well as how best to deal with them, and really use the dollars that you have in the most efficient and beneficial way for the organization. Uh, some of that is up front as far as defense against the documents, but a lot of that also bleeds back into the population that you're looking to protect. There's been a major shift in security that 
has been necessary to come about because of the traditional sense of keeping the users in the dark, keeping them safe without them being involved, and now as we are seeing every day, humans are your last line of defense. We call that the human firewall. So you need to put some investment and some time into educating those, those users on what the best practices is, are, how to carry themselves, because they can be the, the last check that keeps you safe. So uh, they're not the first line of defense, but definitely an important one to focus on. So happy to help be part of this conversation. Um, so, so as same, same as Dan's presentation, I have a whole list of questions, and, and I'll begin the questions. But you know, feel free to interject with your own questions so you get the most out of this session. Um, so, so the first question I have is for you, President Larson, just in terms of the incident. Um, prior to the incident, did you have a formal um, security plan in place, or was that, or, or how did it evolve after? Who specifically within the institution got involved? So we were just beginning to put a security plan in place. There were measures in place, um, but there was not a um, strict set of protocols that we had um, followed. The system was just introducing six new policies. So we were in the process of identifying how those policies became procedures and practices at our institution. Since then, we have continued to build on a plan that is encompassing of what does it mean at the institution? What data are we holding? Um, what practices are we following? What is the retention policy that we have for data and information? What are the practices that we put in place that require training and how often does the training exist? And how do we become diligent at making sure that what we're saying is put into practice? So following up on those things and having exercises that will show that we're um, following our safety precautions and the plan that we put in place. So, you know, were there trustees involved in the process, or it was it just administration? Well, when one thing happens from a college when you're part of a system, it happens to all the colleges. And so the trustees have been involved from an arm's length distance, right? So when we would meet um, through board of trustees meetings, they had asked me for one potential update. I'll give another one here in the next few months. But um, really, it becomes then part of the practice of the system and how the system, we have a CIO of the system that will continue to update the board of trustees um, and engage them through their policy work and um, through um, just the idea of what does this mean to our institutions and how can they be involved and how can they be informed. So um, one of the things that I've experienced in institutions I've been at is that these issues are raised uh, here in Massachusetts, you know, whatever, 201, CMR 17, whatever. Uh, the laws around it are clear, but the funds needed sometimes is, are large. And it's hard sometimes in the mix of priorities institutions are facing to get this behind the scenes, you get no payback for it unless you have an incident. Um, you know, done. So what do you do either as a vendor or as a president um, to uh, explain how to balance that and then find ways for schools to figure out how to afford to do this? Uh, you know, I, I think the, uh, the key thing there is to take a, a risk-based approach. Um, so start with a risk assessment. What, identify what the top risks are, and from there identify what the possible ways are to address them. Uh, once you have, so for it, user education uh, is probably one of the most cost-effective ways to address security these days because a lot of the threats are, as you know, it's the same, go after users. Um, so it doesn't take a lot of technology necessarily, uh, it just takes education, uh, which can be done in, in any number of ways. But once you have a, a, a risk assessment that identifies what the top risks are, then you can develop a prioritized approach to how you're going to address those risks in a cost-effective manner based on the budget you have, 
The other thing that gives you is the ability to then take that risk assessment to your cyber insurance company, if you don't have one, or if you have one, and say, these are the things that I need to transfer to you because I can't do it. What would it take to insure against these risks? Um, something we see a lot of companies do and, and organizations is they just take a separate insurance policy before they do a risk assessment. So they don't really know what they need or what, yeah, what, that, what they are getting actually covers it. So those, those would be a couple of key, key thoughts there. Additionally, and I'm not an insurance expert here, but that cyber insurance, cybersecurity insurance typically carries a, uh, a cost based on the risk exposure that your organization faces. So if you do the risk assessment, you may you achieve that insurance rate, you can then go to the board and say, I can reduce our insurance payments by implementing these new features or new technologies. And maybe that's not something you can do day one, but if they can realize the, the return over time of that, you may have an easier time justifying that spend, right? Uh, but it always takes seeing what the bigger dollar thing is first to tell them you'll save them money down the road. So I would agree. We um, have conducted a risk management assessment. Um, we certainly did have the bond, which had already been identified for those things. But we've built that into our annual um, operations budget. And so we will make sure that we're paying attention to those things, just like deferred maintenance, right? It's easy to get away from those things when other things come up. But what we have found through our years of experience in higher ed, that once you start to do that, those things become bigger problems down the line that had you addressed them earlier, you would not have had those. So it just needs to become a commitment. Um, training is certainly critical that we have found um, college-wide as well as for your IT team and to ensure that they are up to date on the certifications that are important to your institution um, but then the diligence that you have across the institution for your students and for your staff um, that training that prevention aspect uh, is something that um, has high high containment potentially um, but has high value and that's where we've put a lot of our emphasis up front. Thanks very much. I just wanted to follow up actually on the idea of risk assessment. I think our colleges, and I'm from a public system, um, are more comfortable being transparent about some parts of our practices that we'd like to improve. I'm not sure that this is a place where we are comfortable being as transparently vulnerable as we really are, so I'm wondering if you have any advice on how to handle that. I think you know cybersecurity risk assessment is something that you do have to be a little careful about how transparent you are with it. Um, I actually had a client last last week. He had his uh, IT manager leave. We have been working with him on the penetration test, you know, full blown vulnerability scan. And uh, the IT manager left, so the director didn't have the full report. He sent me an email saying, I, I think I worked with you, could you just send me the full report? So at that point I picked up the phone call and him say, hey, uh, is it really you who asked me for this report? I don't really want to share all your vulnerabilities with someone who might not be you. <laughs> um, so I think you do need to treat it with, with the confidentiality and sensitivity it, it, it needs to have. Uh, and we have seen approaches where an executive summary, for example, is published and circulated to a broader management and governance group, but the detailed uh, report doesn't. So the detailed report that goes into the technical aspects might stay just within the technical teams, and that's, that's an approach to, to manage that risk. You certainly don't want to put it on, on bullet and board in the kitchen. <laughs> But but you need your your board to understand, and you right. need to be making new budgeting decisions. Right. So. Uh, 
So I just wanted to uh, circle back um, to a point that you had raised in your opening comments. When we had this conversation six or seven years ago, data privacy and security was a completely different beast. Um, equally as bad, I would argue that it's 10 times worse now because every time we build a wall, they build a bigger ladder to uh, get over that wall. But with Gremlin's plan and the implications that that has on Title IV, um, responsibility for student data, uh, for your student financial aid participants. And this whole concept of GDPR, which is now over in, the, in, you know, in Europe, but California's passed their own sort of version of GDPR and we know it's coming. The whole concept of data privacy and security has changed and I think it's, it's really important to highlight that. And I know we've had these conversations, but talking about what you know, we're not talking about now just somebody hacking your system. It's the actual protection of an individual's data. Like the rights that I have as a human being, by virtue of my existence, I have inherent rights under these new laws, which I don't know that the steps around data privacy and security have, you know, we, we're, we're focused on boarding up the wall so nobody can get in. But I don't know that the policies have evolved to deal with this whole concept of personal identity. Um, so I don't know if we could spend a little bit more time talking about that and the implications, particularly in the higher ed environment. So, and, uh, and, and, uh, yeah, I can let me do that. And, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of think, thought that has been going into that space in, in this room as, as well. So I'd be interested to, to see uh, everybody else's thoughts. Um, I mean, as Doug just mentioned, you know, the, the key fundamental principle in, in the European view is that data privacy is a fundamental human right. So the GDPR is thought to have six core principles. I tend to think of principle zero being it's my data and uh, you're here to just protect it. Uh, no, it's, it's never your data, the organizational data, regardless of how many times I may have given it to you. So, given that it's my data, I as an individual can ask the organization, and this, this ties directly into what we were talking about earlier, about one of the ways to, uh, to expand is to go look for more international students, right? We are more and more exposed to these regulations that way. So if I'm trying to attract students from France, from Belgium, from Austria, from Spain, or whatever, um, if I'm collecting that data through a website that's targeting them and they're filling up applications from Europe, that data is protected by the GDPR. So they could come to you and say, could you please tell me anything and everything about what you're doing with my data? Or they could come to you and say, can you just delete my data, full stop. If you want a, um, how many of you have seen the uh, this LinkedIn post um, that called the Nightmare GDPR Letter? Uh, I, I, I strongly recommend it. Just Google Nightmare GDPR Letter, you'll get to a LinkedIn post that goes on to four pages uh, on everything an individual could be asking you to do about their data. Uh, and if you don't do those things to their satisfaction, then they have legal standing to file a complaint. And that's new. Uh, it's also new in that the GDPR introduces a mechanism for class action complaints, not through law firms, but through nonprofits. But that's what got Google, for example. That was a consumer complaint, not a regulatory action. So it wasn't, you know, the, the, the regulators in Europe who went after Google, it was consumers. So that's a, a whole new level that we, we have to worry about uh, as well. So is that something that you have started, you know, just following the room, is, there, is that something that you have started seeing uh, individuals asking you, well, how are you maintaining the privacy of my data, or can you, you know, show me what to do with it or delete it? Like that, onto that. Um, I see organizations like the New England Board of Higher Education as a way for individual organizations to actually consolidate and streamline that process. 
as you need to do RFPs and RFIs if there's an aggregate board that retains all of that data, it makes it much easier to produce the controls and security around the various vendors that you may use. And that's a lot of the material you'll produce if somebody requests those type of controls is maybe not just what your institution does to provide that security, but also what type of encryption mechanisms your uh, vendors use to maintain that data if you outsource it and things of that nature. And, and it takes a long time to produce that if you have to do the legwork yourself. Whereas when you organize and, and group this, th these things up, you may be able to find a, a security dossier that's already been produced for you, so it makes it easier. Um, and with the, with the idea of protecting the individual, uh, it is very challenging, especially when it comes to colleges and universities, because you have a very large and uh, temporary population, let's say, with the student base. So they're constantly in flux. They're not necessarily as aligned or as motivated to uh, you know, achieve the security that the institution that the faculty and staff may be trained on because they their allegiance may not be all there, especially if they're you know the, the turnover rate of actual completion of graduation is as low as you say it is that's scary, but it also means that they may really not be invested in the organization. So uh, of the risks, organizations at the educational level have a higher likelihood of insider threat. As I, as I see it, mostly because those insiders aren't, yeah, we put they're one foot insiders, they're students that have access to your systems without really having a paycheck coming from them that they care about. Right? So there's a bigger risk for it. Well, I mean, this, this it really became um, an awareness for us as we were going through this experience. and listening to the first session on uh, recruitment and understanding your market base is that we collect a lot of information on our students, whether it's through financial aid or through student directory information, all of those things. And we want to break down that information to make a lot of decisions about how we're going to help them to come to us, how we're going to keep them, and how we're going to complete them. And so it's really a culture effect of what you need to think about and have those conversations from the very starting point of wanting to collect data is how are you going to use it, when are you going to use it, and how are you going to get rid of it? <laughs> or what processes, whether it's an organization or a firm or your own practices, that, that you have to now add on to that conversation. And is the, import, is the data important that you're asking for? So we, we have a lot of faculty who like to do research on their students and it's, it's, we change the narrative or we change a set of questions of why are they asking the questions that they're even asking and why do they need certain aspects of information. So it really is taking us to new dimensions around understanding students and our stakeholders and what we truly need to begin with to have that. But it changes. It has changed our whole way of doing work around this experience. there's always going to be the new threat as you said to build a wall they're just going to build a taller ladder uh, attackers are always going to be looking for the weak point the chink in your armor because that's their incentive to uh, maximize gains uh, what I can talk about is the major threats that are out there right now that we're seeing as prevalent and not slowing down uh, obviously ransomware is a huge one and it is not just uh, ransomware deployed by one actor or by a very sophisticated um, hacker. Now uh, everyone knows what a SaaS platform is, that's the acronym for cloud. Now there's a RAS, ransomware as a service. So somebody that's either disgruntled or maybe just uh, un underpaid or what have you can go find a service to deploy that ransomware and if they already have access to your systems then nobody even needs to open the attachment in the email because they can just deploy it to your computer lab and spread it that way. Uh, and they get paid for every infection that they pull off. So uh, that could be somebody inside your organization making money off of damaging your organization and there's that insider risk. Additionally, uh, spoofing or the new form of spoofing, which is CEO 
uh, fraud, or we call it whaling, just like uh, in the gambling industry where they're trying to pretend to be or go after the biggest players, mostly the board members, the trustees, uh, the, the CFOs, and, and anybody that can execute financial transactions. And it'll typically just take the form of an email that looks like it's from that person that you know that sits next to you asking you to uh, wire this money or pay this invoice or potentially, and I've seen this too in HR, uh, this is your insurance company, you lost all your W-2s, can you send us a copy of all of them? And then they're gonna do tax return scams and your employees all need credit protection that you then need to pay for. Uh, there's a lot of financial risk there, obviously that's the number one motivator, but nobody ever talks about the unspoken risk to the organization, which is brand damage. If you work at, a, uh, at any company and that company loses your information that you thought that they would, that you entrusted with them because you're an employee, how is that going to do for your morale as an employee of that company? Are you really going to be happy to go to work every day knowing that uh, they just gave away your social security number? And so that leads to a lot of uh, 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 turnover, it leads to a, a lost uh, revenue stream, so if you're talking about maximizing enrollments, it's pretty hard to get students to enroll if you just announce the data breach that involve every student record, uh, like the University of Alaska today, uh, or things like Augusta University last year with 400,000 records. So that's a damage that nobody ever puts a financial price to because you can't. It's hard to know what money would be lost in the future, but you need to think about that as uh, a huge risk as well. So, so when we we uh, we have a team that does nothing but incident response and um, you know breach response all, all day long. So those those are the kinds of things we we see all the time: ransomware, business account compromise. Um, what what we don't see is simple measures that could be taken in advance of those to protect against that. Uh, so. Two-factor authentication, for example, is one that we would like to see a lot more and would completely kill most of these new threats, except nobody wants to do it um, because it's difficult and inconvenient. So that's, that's you know, in terms of, of battles to be fought, uh, I think that's, that's definitely front and center in our mind of measures you could take that could really help with preventing all of this. Uh, it's, it's right up there. The other one is planning ahead of time. Um, in, in, my, in my world, and I'm sure in yours too, there's two kinds of organizations in this world, those that have been breached and know it, and those that have been breached and don't know it yet. Uh, and, and you know, breach can be around for years in some cases without anybody noticing. Uh, ransomware developed a, a side gig called um, crypto jacking, where we're not, we're not going to infiltrate the system to, uh, to post a ransom, we're going to infiltrate it to have your systems mine Bitcoin for us. And you're not going to know where they are, except your systems might be slower. Uh, so that's, that's another kind of, of threat out there. So planning ahead is, is really key, having an incident response plan. And my, the, the image I like to, I like to show for that is, everybody remembers when that US Airways plane landed on the Hudson? I, I told you I, was, I, I had been around for a while. Um, do you remember what happened like 20 minutes later? Uh, the CEO of US Airways was on TV explaining what happened. That wasn't a coincidence, right? That was part of a plan that had been well thought through ahead of time, well rehearsed uh, and put in motion and, you know, damage control in front of the press right then and there. Um, so at that point, obviously, the details of what had happened were not known, but they had a plan and they executed. So that's, that's what you need to be in a position to do. And that, that doesn't take, oh, that's not a huge challenge. Um, putting an incident response plan is, is a well understood process. Uh, your cyber insurance company can help you with that even. Um, any, any, you know, forensics firm can help, uh, law firms can, can help with that. Uh, but it will make a huge difference if you're not trying to improvise how you're going to respond to a threat once it's happened. So, for example, email compromise we just talked about as one of the key things that, that happens these days. 
how are you going to communicate internally about an incident and what you're doing about it by email? Because we see that all the time, right? You know the hackers are in your system and you're communicating through the system that they've just hacked. So thinking ahead, having a, a, an out of band mechanism that you can communicate, whether it's text messaging, some other system, is, is really will, will get you ahead. Uh, and it's not difficult or expensive, but you just have to think about it ahead of time. So how does it make you all feel today? <laughs> Just these two talking about it. <laughs> um, so immediately after this had happened, we did have an experience where people were receiving emails from me about their work, and so we had to really take um, caution against that. And um, our HR office also got emails from me saying that my bank had changed and all of my funds should not be distributed to this bank, if any of you would receive that. That was a fun one, too, to get. Um, but because of this, it has made us think about everything as it relates to technology, right? And so um, everything that you want to do at your institutions for the good of your students, if it involves technology, you really have to take that second moment to say, what, how can this hurt as well as how can this help? And that's everything, you know? I mean, I read about one college who wanted to put in, in, in the residence halls, um, the Alexa or something like that, and you have to think about that. What is that doing to collect information on your students? We have our facilities team that um, there are certain buildings that they wanted to put um, some technology in that they could they could see what was happening outside, whether it was through the doorbell or something else. And we decided not to do those things, not to put anything at risk um, as it relates to that. So. Everything becomes a new decision point of what what are the impacts that this could potentially have. And that's what makes it great and dangerous all at the same time is, and I think having that incident response plan is good. It's gonna help you in all types of situations that come up, but certainly being able to be responsive quickly and have a set of um, FAQs or um, how it is and resources that you can help individuals and not using your email to do that was critical for us anyway of how we got that information out. I have a slight shift on the two groups of people uh, that Elaine mentioned. Uh, I quantify them into the, the planning group and the hoping group. Uh, the people that have a plan for when they get breached and the people that hope they never get breached in the first place and they're the group that doesn't know that they've been breached. Um, so typically we see the hopers shift into planners after they either get attacked or their neighbor gets attacked, right? So the doom and gloom is, is not worth spending the money on until you actually realize it, right? It becomes a reality. Uh, so with that in mind, what you need to look for is technology and systems that are resilient to that risk of attack as well as making sure that they can stay in play throughout a, an attack or a breach. Uh, historically, if you looked at infrastructure, you you know segregate that infrastructure and have high availability and, and your production sites and be able to hot swap between them so that if failover was necessary, you didn't miss a beat. And what I see with universities now and, and a lot of higher ed is that you're moving to much more of an online presence. There's a lot more online only student databases and so you can't afford downtime because there's no other way for the students to learn in that type of environment. So you still need that high availability. You almost require it more than when everybody was sitting on campus. Uh, so how do you do that? Well, that's where cloud is actually a huge benefit because with cloud infrastructure, uh, the cost and complexity of managing your own high availability is now offloaded onto a much more dispersed uh, infrastructure that with that sharing of those resources, which is what cloud allows, it keeps that cost down. That's why we're seeing this major shift from on-prem email to Office 365, for example, because they make it so affordable you can't say no. Nobody's gonna update to Exchange 2020. I don't even think they're gonna release that at this point, right? Uh, but there's a big problem with cloud, and that problem is that consolidation makes a higher uh, target base in that footprint. If an attacker's looking to compromise one organization, they use one system like Office 365, and it works, 
I know that every other organization that uses Office 365 is also susceptible. So you have a much bigger target on your back when you share the same systems. So you need to understand that and find a system or a platform that allows you to control your own destiny while maximizing that, that reduction in cost and complexity. One question. So in terms of choosing a cloud provider, you know, get, who, where does the risk lie in terms of the data? Is it does that risk transfer to the cloud provider? Uh, I, I was just going to jump on with it. Uh, yeah, just, just because it, uh, a cloud provider provides safety from the cost of building out your own infrastructure doesn't mean you're not responsible for it. Right. Uh, and that's something we see. Uh, I had a, a client asked me the other day, can you? Uh, Help me make my uh, Office 365 GDPR, sorry, Office 365 migration GDPR compliant. And, and the answer is sure. As, as long as you have a GDPR compliance program in the first place, <coughs> we can do that. But in isolation by itself, it's not going to be GDPR compliant. So you're still responsible, and, and the GDPR and other regulations certainly make it clear that it is still you who owns that infrastructure. Um, your typical Amazon cloud server has about 3,000 configuration settings. So you need to make sure you understand what you're getting into. And I'll, I'll put my, uh, my big, I had a big lights somewhere and say, for, for, uh, for sure, turn on two factor authentication on your cloud systems whenever and wherever you can, no matter how inconvenient it might be to the people who need to log into them. Um, there's ways to mitigate the inconvenience, but the most, one of the most common passwords, just look at the, just Google top 20 passwords out there. Uh, password one with a capital P and the number one at the end is, is typically a very common one still. It's still in the top 20. Anyone who can log into your cloud service with the username they can guess and password one because that's what they could be bothered to use, can just get access to your system. So making sure that you have proper access controls and that, that you understand how to configure the systems is, uh, is key because you're still responsible for them. And all these new regulations will, will still hold you accountable, not the cloud providers. Two point. I agree with you about 80% of that. There is one time where the provider may be held accountable, and that's if they don't live up to the um, design that they have contracted with you for. So yes, you're required, you're responsible for configuration, you're responsible for implementation, but if the provider says we use AES 256-bit encryption, and then lo and behold, somebody decrypts their data because they were actually storing passwords in plain text, um, while it was your job to ensure that they weren't storing passwords in plain text, if all the available information upon request was that they did and then they didn't, they may be held responsible for that. But that's a very small sliver, and most providers aren't going to make those mistakes um, because that would uh, lead to them having some risk, which providers are very good at avoiding uh, compared to the individual. We, we could agree to disagree. We, we could continue talking yeah. for hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, finally, uh, logging and auditing, right? Especially when it comes to cloud providers or uh, GDPR, for example. Uh, any access should be logged. Uh, that's something that in the planning mindset you would want for forensic analysis for a post-breach uh, response. Now with cloud, that's important because it's not a door in your environment that somebody's breaking into. It's something that you never saw them walk into, and so you need to know about that through auditing and logging. But additionally, with GDPR, if somebody requests right to be forgotten, uh, that means you're deleting all the data. So you need to have a paper trail of the request to delete the data from somebody whose data you're deleting, and that leads to this catch-22 of I have to delete the request to delete the data, so now how do I have evidence that I was supposed to purge that data? So logging and a paper trail of all the processes that you follow during that uh, is very important because it's it, it, it gets very blurry very quickly if you don't have very thorough notes taken uh, through automated controls. I forget what I was talking about. <laughs> You talk about you know, those 
two different populations of, you know, there's one subset that doesn't know they're being had. Um, how is it if, it can, you know, if, it, if they can be unknown for potentially months, maybe a year, that they're, they've been had? Is there anything from a system um, process or you know, controls that they can do monitoring lives to catch that sooner? Is there anything that, that can be done? Yeah. And, uh, I'll stop. And, 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 so I think one, one thing that is not been done because again it's one of those things we're not in the habit of doing is the, the old traditional thinking is we want to keep things from coming into our environment, right? So we're monitoring what the tax might be coming with the fire. What we're not doing much of is monitoring what's going out. So one of the companies I work with uh, is a defense contractor. And one of the changes they made at some point years ago was start monitoring anything and everything that's trying to get out of the network. And one day they found a PC, just a random PC on a desk that was just all of a sudden sending a tiny little bit of traffic trying to connect to a server that turned out to be in China. So they took this thing off the network and, and dissected it and found that it had been configured, of course it was a malware, uh, but it, that malware was configured to just sit there and wait for two years before it tried to connect to anything. And after two years it started trying to connect to China. Uh, if they had not been monitoring the traffic that was trying to go out, they would never have known. Um, so that's that's one one change that we uh, we have to start thinking. Assume your network has been compromised, which it probably has in some way, um, and start thinking about well, how do we catch the things that shouldn't go out from going out? Whether it's data loss prevention um, or more sophisticated. The other uh, stat I like to throw out is that only 40% of traffic is monitored, and that aligns with what Alain is talking about, where most of the time you're not looking at what's going out, you're also not looking at what's flowing internally as much as you could be. Uh, typically, you put a lot of weight on what's coming in, and that's that 40% of uh, total traffic volume that you may be analyzing today, uh, but making incremental steps to start scrutinizing, scrutinizing other portions of, of your data that's flowing uh, can uh, highlight potential uh, corruptions or uh, infections that may have been ongoing. So starting slowly, like scrutinizing outbound traffic or maybe not putting uh, hard defined controls in place, maybe just starting with monitoring first uh, reduces the impact of the organization, uh, and it can also keep your operations a little more covert so that if the attackers don't know that they're already under uh, scrutiny, they may continue uh, on a normal uh, progression. So like uh, Alain mentioned, that they was still trying to connect to China. However, if the attacker knew that there was outbound monitoring in place, they might have stopped that to try and hide themselves and stay persistent. Uh, so starting slowly and using a, a monitor first before implementing a, a shutdown type control allows you to, to collect data uh, to do a better job at understanding what the problem is. If they had just taken that box, unplugged it from the network right away, pulled the power cord, and taken it into a shop, it may have been hard to perceive what type of data it was communicating out or where it was talking to. So um, that's one of the things that law enforcement and forensics really uh, uses to actually solve these cases as opposed to just write a report is uh, the data you collect after you realize that you have been attacked but before the attack is shut down. Uh, the number one mistake I see organizations do is purge all evidence of that because it's better to, you know, kind of wash it and push it under the rug than let it be known. But that's going to hurt you in the long run of knowing what just happened. Yes, I, I agree. Um, we do monitor um, everything coming in, everything going out, not everything, but we do a, a review of that. Um, and that, that was a, a learning curve for us of what was going out. And it, it took that virus for us to start to look at that. So 
it's it's vitally important. And how was your interaction with uh, law enforcement? Uh, it was actually very good. Yeah. And that was helpful for them too. So they, they really could not have been more helpful in, in working through those processes. Uh, yeah, one, I, know, I know the comment on law enforcement. Um, is one, one of the things I've done is work with some of the very largest breaches in, in the country. Um, it used to be that law enforcement was the last people you wanted to talk to because um, if you had a breach and you went to law enforcement, they were going to start by taking over your, your system and said, okay, fine, this is now an active investigation. Thank you very much for bringing it to our, our attention. You are, you are out of your systems now. Now, the, over the last several years, the, the tube has very much changed where they're no longer treating um, the target of a hack as um, you know, something other than the victim. <laughs> they, they were not really looking at them as, as victims. Uh, and they're really going out of their way to help out. Um, so there's a delicate balance as to who you should call first because every firm you work with would say talk to us first. Your insurance company will say that. And in fact, your cyber insurance policy, if you have one, probably has a clause in there that says, oh, by the way, we're not going to cover you if you don't notify us immediately upon discovery or a breach. Um, your own law firm would probably say much the same thing. Call us first, don't call your cyber. So you have to think, one of the things you have to think about in, in, in and that is your in the incident response plan is how do you navigate, who to contact, and in what order, and what kind of circumstances. So I guess one last question I have is, so if you have information security plan, how often should that be looked at, revised, and then how do you continuously engage your stakeholders, students, faculty, trustees, in regards to this ever-changing environment and how to make changes? So, um, we're in our first year. So we'll be reviewing it here in the next few months, probably um, first part of July. And we'll start with our college um, employees and take that out. But it'll take some time for us to get through all of that. And aligned to that, then, will be a set of training that we have ongoing. And we continue to build on and add to as, as that becomes available to us and to all the stakeholders involved. Um, and then as part of a system, we'll be looking at that as well. So the CIO has a set of information and practices that he'll follow on a regular basis, I think it'll be two times a year that they'll look at it from a system perspective. Um, but then that ties into the, the regular cycle of an institution, right? So how you do your academic planning, how you do your budget planning, how you do your facilities planning, that plan ties into that and becomes just part of our um, workflow process. Uh, yeah, part, part of the answer to that is also regulatory. In Massachusetts, you, you have to review uh, you have to at least look at your plan once a year. Uh, doesn't necessarily need to be updated. If there's nothing to be updated because nothing has changed in cybersecurity in a year, that'd be surprising, but <laughs> to make the case. Um, but parts of the plan should be updated more frequently. If you if you learn about something that needs to be updated because of some yeah. development uh, you learned of, you know, I would have waited here to learn. I see, I see two different uh, mentalities. There's the bare minimum, do it once a year, maybe biannual, uh, especially when you're first starting that program. Uh, biannual seems like a lot because you're probably spending more time on it than just you know one or one week uh, every uh, twice a year. Uh, because you're already neck deep in it anyway, but on an ongoing basis, I see some other organizations that are much more proactive and incorporated into their change control uh, you know, monthly or quarterly meetings to review not just what they need to change based on uh, organizational demand, but also what regulations have maybe changed that require changes of the organization. So it just depends on how uh, sophisticated and how tied your change control group is to uh, the rest of the industry. If you have somebody from legal in there, if you have uh, members of the board in the change control advisory group, then that becomes a, a much bigger focus for change controls. Uh, when it comes to interacting with the stakeholders, uh, I see education as something that is not just a 
uh, annual process anymore. It's something that needs to be inherently tied into their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, there was a study that said that um, the memory of an individual for adhering to best security practices is about 60 days. So if they aren't educated on best practices for security once every two months, they're not going to follow the best practices anymore. So uh, as opposed to requiring somebody, and the, the other problem is, uh, especially now with the advent of you know, Netflix, Facebook, all these other things, our attention uh, span has shortened down to, I think the average attention span for adults is less than eight minutes, uh, which is not surprising, right? How many people have checked their phones at least twice during this panel, right? Uh, so you need to, instead of having, you know, hourly trainings where people sit in a room, they're going to tune out to it, you need to have it built into, oh, you logged in today, just ask this, just answer this quick security question, or hey, I sent you a video. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, security is something that's made all of our collective stomachs for lunch maybe, you know, get a little tight today, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, especially when it comes to the, uh, the individual level, the, the students, the faculty, making it approachable, making it fun, making it something that maybe it's not just gamified, but it's easier to uh, adopt. It makes it an easier approach. So fun little, hey, did you know attackers will pretend to be your best friend? Um, make sure that's, especially for the student population, make sure that is that, that girl that you saw at the bar last night before you send her your DP as the acronym is known now. You know. uh, things like that, which students will laugh at, but they'll also start to, the ball, start to think about it, right? Um, I talked to somebody in the audience and said, yeah, so if anytime somebody gets an email from me asking to pay an invoice, they have to pick up the phone and call me, but maybe it's, hey, uh, I'm not calling you because I haven't asked you about the invoice, I just wanted to know what you had for lunch today because they had lunch today with them. So that's a security check. It's, you know, ways of making it fun and bringing the institution together into a cohesive working collective uh, is security at the end of the day. Uh, one, one thing I do when I teach uh, security awareness training programs is, is make it about them, not not about the institution. So uh, what what would happen to you if your bank account was hacked? If uh, someone got your password to, uh, to your online banking account, to your credit report, uh, to your smartphone, uh, etc. And if you train people on Safety measures, like like any other safety program, if you think about it, right? If you teach them how to be safe in their personal lives, they bring those habits back to work or back to school, depending on their role in the institution. Um, so that helps with retention. Just make it personal. Make sure they understand why you are asking about the fact of authentication. Uh, how you know they need to secure their own cell phone accounts, right? Make sure you have a pin with your carrier so that nobody can call and say, hey, I'm so-and-so, can you, I just got a flashy new device, can you port my number to this phone? Um, because that, that happens a lot, right? That's a way to spoof two-factor authentication if it's not via text messaging. So so make it personal to them, and then they'll, uh, they'll return it a lot better, and they'll, uh, they'll bring it in. Are we here? Here we go. Oh, yeah, we have to wait a couple seconds. Um, just uh, again on behalf of um, RSM, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, you know, we try to brainstorm over here about how to make this something that people want to come to. If you get any ideas, if there's anything that you want to talk about, if you'd like to get some experts on camp to come talk about, let us know. We'll put this together however is best for you, because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. So, again, on behalf of RSM, I'd like to thank you, and I'll pass it over to Michael for final words. Uh, two final words, thank you. Uh, <laughs> really a pleasure to be here. Dan, thanks to you and your team uh, for his uh, suggestion. We'd love for your additional but uh, what you'd like to talk about next year or even in the interim. So uh, everyone have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks again to the Nebby team and the RSM team. And